Amen. Hmm. All right, if you have your Bible tonight, turn to Ephesians 3 with me, verse 15. We'll have a little Bible study tonight. Ephesians chapter number 3, verse number 15. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Father, bless your holy word now. And I pray that you give me wisdom in the scripture and unction. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I want to talk to you tonight about the family of God. Uh, just a cursory understanding of the family of God will help you a great deal in understanding the Bible. All of the Bible is given by inspiration of God. All of the Bible is profitable for all of us. No question about it. But all of the Bible is not speaking directly to us. You need to understand that the Bible is not a book of religion written by someone so that man can become religious. The Bible is God's word covering religion in the sense that it speaks of spirituality and your relationship with God, but it's also a history book. And it goes all the way back to the creation of man, history of man, history of a people, the Jewish people. And it's a history, not only history, but it's a prophecy book. It speaks of the future. We're living in the fulfillment of so many prophecies right now that will blow your mind. Amen. If you've been in Sunday school this morning and next Sunday morning hear what I'm talking about, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say prophecies are being fulfilled. Amen. Let's go back to the beginning and talk about the family of God. Uh, first of all, I'll identify myself to you tonight. I'm a Gentile. As far as I know, I haven't done a genealogical search of my, my family uh, name. I don't know what's in the past that far back, but as far as I know, I'm a Gentile. And we may have some folks in here tonight who are Jews. Who knows? But that's the two basic qualifications and categories of humanity, Jew, Gentile, either one or the other. Some folks, mixture of both, but either Jew or Gentile. But let's go back to a time before there was a Jew. In the beginning, when God made the first man, that first man that he made was Adam. And the first time genealogy is mentioned, when Adam had a son in his own likeness, was not Cain. But when you read the Bible carefully, you'll find out the first son that Adam had, that he said he had in his own image, was Seth. And so the Bible talks about the Gentiles before the flood or before the law. And that would be Noah and Adam. These are Gentiles. They're part of the family of God. Amen. How were they saved? They were saved by trusting God and believing what he'd revealed to them. Amen. They had no Bible. They had no preachers. They had no temple. There was no priesthood. None of that existed. None of it whatsoever. Yet they believed God's word as it had been revealed to them in that time. Amen. These are Gentiles. These are Gentiles before the flood and before the law. Then you have saved Hebrews before the law. These are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We find their life given to us in the book of Genesis. From these people come the Jewish people. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are, uh, these are uh, Hebrews. Now, these are Hebrews and not Jews before the Jewish people came into being. Amen. These are Hebrews. Abraham was a Hebrew. His father was Eber, E-B-E-R. They're part of the family of God. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were Hebrews. Noah and Adam were Gentiles. Amen. They're both part of the family of God. Family of God, once we get done with this thing tonight, find out it's awful big. <laughs> then we have Jewish believers under the law. These are men like Moses all the way up to John the Baptist. Amen. John the Baptist was not a member of the body of Christ, folks. Luke 16 says uh, that the law and the prophets were until John since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. So from Moses to John the Baptist, these Jews make up the Jews that were under the law. In plain words, the law was given to bind them and their relationship with God. None of them were ever saved by keeping the law. Right. Nobody has ever been saved by keeping the law. Well, how are they say, preacher? Believe God. The just shall live by his faith. The book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. Faith is always an element in the salvation of anybody. Makes no difference how much revelation, how much light they have. Faith is an, is an intrinsic part 
of your salvation. Amen. If you don't believe God and you don't believe the revelation you have and what you've got, you're not going to be saved whatsoever. Amen. So we have the Jewish believers under the law, Moses to John the Baptist. The law came by Moses, the Bible said, and grace and truth by our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we have, turn to Romans chapter number 2 and verse 15. This is the first scripture I'll have you turn to. We have Gentile believers during the law. These are not Jews. These are Gentiles. Romans chapter number 2 and verse number 15. Let's start reading with verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, that's as clear as it can be, folks, which have not the laws, notice that, notice carefully, they have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. What's that? That's the spiritual revelation of God's moral code and his holiness. For whatever that they have in their conscience, the Bible says, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Now watch this, verse 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. A prime example of that is Abimelech in the Old Testament book of Genesis. Abimelech was the king of Gerar. Abraham was moving around throughout that land all the time. And he moved into the area of Abimelech with his wife, Sarah, who was his half-sister. It's important to remember now, she was his half-sister. Abraham feared what these locals would do to his wife because she was a beautiful woman. Amen. The Bible said, very fair to look upon so he said, you tell them that you're not my wife, but my sister. All right, what do, we, what do we have here? We have subterfuge. We have a half truth. But she had a greater relationship with him than sister, and that was wife. Amen. But in any event, this, uh, he told Abimelech that. And the Bible says that God shut up all the wombs in the house of Abimelech. And when he did that, Abimelech found out there's something wrong between him and God. Amen. And so Abimelech went to Abraham, and Abraham told him the truth. And Abimelech said, God has kept me from sinning against you. And, a and Abimelech does not have the law. He does not have a Bible. He does not have a priesthood. But he's got a conscience, and he's got light. And he follows what he's got. And because of that, the Bible said plainly, God blessed Abimelech and opened up the wombs of his, of his, uh, of his, of, of his family. So what is that? That's a prime example of a man who is, is in every sense a pagan, yet he has some truth and he holds on to the truth he's got. And, and, and that's exactly who we're talking about in the book of Romans chapter number two. So these are Gentiles during the law. Notice the wording, not under the law. Gentiles were never under the law unless they wanted to become a proselyte. Amen. Gentiles who were Gentiles during the law. What's the span of that? I don't know the span of that. I do know in the book of Acts when uh, the apostle Paul was preaching to the uh, Stoics, the Picureans at Athens, Greece from Mars Hill, he told them that there was a time of ignorance and God winked at it. He winked at that time of ignorance. But the Bible says, he, and, and the apostle preached to them and said, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. Yep. Amen. <clears throat> you can put a number of scriptures together to kind of get an idea of what's going on here. But here's the bottom line. Gentiles that were never under the law, but they are part of the family of God because God blessed Abimelech for following the light that he had. And so this is the situation, part of the family of God. Then you have church age believers from the book of Acts all the way, Acts chapter number two, all the way to the rapture. Say so the word rapture is not in the Bible, catching up is. <laughs> And the church age saints, the church age saints, and if I, if you are a dispensationalist tonight, you can understand that. You have no problem understanding that God works with mankind according to a certain code or covenant or standard or law or something. 
And that is a dispensation. And that dispensation, they're all temporal. They all last so far, so long. They start somewhere and end somewhere. What we're living in now is called the dispensation of the grace of God. Not the law. We're not living under the law. We never were under the Gentiles. We never, are, never were under the law. But we're living in what's called the dispensation of the grace of God, which is the church age, the body of Christ, the church age. So therefore, we are members of the body of Christ, and we're also members of the family of God. Amen. We have a twofold relationship with God tonight. Our twofold relationship is, number one, we are members of the family of God. The extended family of God, the church belongs to that, but we have another relationship with Him that's unique to us. We are members of the body of Christ. Yes, Amen. Amen. And that will end when He comes to catch His bride up to meet Him in the clouds. Amen. That will come to a halt. And so we have a twofold relationship with the Lord God as part of the family of God. Then we have the Jewish believers, turn to Revelation chapter number 14. Jewish believers in the tribulation period. Revelation 14 and what you find here is 140 and 4,000 at verse number 1. Do you see that? Revelation 14, verse 1. Now go back to chapter number 7, and we'll get a little more understanding of what's going on. And verse number 4, Revelation 7, 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the, of, uh, of the church age. I messed up. I'm glad you caught me. What does it say? Well, the church replaces Israel. That's not right, is it? No. You see, the Protestant church has done a job for the last <coughs> hundreds of years of trying to kick Israel out and take its place and call the church the fulfillment of all of these prophecies as it relates to Israel. That's horrible doctrine. Yes, That's terrible. Amen. Israel is still Israel, and the church is the church, and they're not the same. Amen. Jews can be members of the body of Christ Amen. along with Gentiles. Yes. But when it comes to Israel, there's a difference. Now, here's something that you've got to think about tonight. I believe, I hope you do too, and I think most of you do, I believe this is talking about literal Israel and literal Jews yes. in, in, uh, in Revelation chapter number 7. The number 144,000 represents 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel, and you've got 12 times 12 is 144,000. There's a couple of tribes in here that's, that's, uh, that's different. It's odd what's going on here. But that's a different study altogether. What we need to focus our attention on tonight is this. God is going to call the Jews forth again, and they are going to become the evangelists to the world. Amen. Now, I believe that, and I believe that's a literal interpretation of Revelation 7 and 14. By believing that, that tells me that Romans chapter number 11 is going to be fulfilled when the scales fall from the eyes of the Jews Amen. and they are once again elevated to the head of all the nations. Amen. Therefore, he must have an earthly people that he comes back that becomes the people who open the door into the millennium and the millennial reign of Christ. Amen. And that's going to be the Jews. Amen. That's going to be the Jews. So we have this, these are part of the family of God. The family of God will be the Jews, the Jewish believers in the tribulation period. Now look at chapter number 7, verse number 9, Revelation 7, 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all, now watch this, of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues, stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb. Who are these people? These are not Jews. These are Gentiles. These are Gentiles during the tribulation period. 
You've got Jews in the tribulation period and you've got Gentiles in the tribulation period. You say, well, that's the church. No, it's not the church. Amen. The church is gone. Amen. The church leaves out in chapter number, uh, Revelation chapter number four and five and doesn't show up again until chapter 19 Amen. when heaven opens and behold a white horse. The apostle said, we're not appointed to wrath to obtain salvation. Amen. So this is part of the family of God. These are Gentile believers during the tribulation period. Well, how many are there going to be? There's going to be a multitude you can't number. The greatest revival that the earth will ever know is coming. Yeah, it's in the future. It's in the future. And it's going to be during that seven years of Jacob's trouble. Amen. If you want to see people born again, you want to see people, see people saved and see the movement of the Spirit of God like we've never seen him before, we need to get out of here. <laughs> Amen. 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 He needs to come and get us. And then you'll see a movement for seven years. And so, oh, so many of our brethren today are falling for, this, for the idea that the church is going to go through the tribulation period. And one of the, one of the scripture in Revelation 7 is proof text to them. No, we're not. The body of Christ is gone. We leave out of here before the tribulation starts. So now we have here, we have Gentile believers in tribulation. Now there's another group of believers that make up the family of God, and that's in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 6. Revelation chapter number 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Obviously, since it's called the first resurrection, there must be another resurrection, see? And there is. And the first resurrection comes in more than one installment. For when the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, he arose from the dead never to die again. And the Bible said he's the first fruits of them that slept. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. He rises from the dead never to die again. Amen. That is the first fruits of the resurrection. And we, when he comes to catch us up to meet him in the clouds, 1 Thessalonians 4, that is a part of the first resurrection. Amen. And it's the rapture of the body of Christ. So here we have in Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 6. Let's read it. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. Now watch this. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign spiritually an indefinite period of time. <laughs> That's not right, is it? I can't, I can't pull anything over on you all. You, get, you catch me right off the bat. That's exactly right. What does it say? A thousand years. That's plain as it can be. Mill annum. It's a Latin term. It's a conjunction of two words. Mill annum. Mill is a thousand. Annum year. A thousand years. They'll reign, reign with Christ for a thousand years. All right. What's that? That's a millennium. This is why I, I am a premillennialist. I believe the Lord's going to come back, catch up his saints to meet him in the clouds, seven years of tribulation period, and then the millennium. Who are these people, preacher? These people are people that some of them are born in the tribulation period, born during that period of time, and they go into the millennium. Some of them are the, are, the, are the nations that befriend Israel. And the sheep on the one hand, the goats on the other hand, he said, enter thou in the kingdom. And because they had befriended Israel, they had become a friend to the Jewish people during the tribulation period, he lets them go right into the millennium for a thousand years. So everything in the future as it relates to their relationship with God is how they treat the Jewish people. It's very important tonight to understand that there's only one nation on this earth that God guarantees to exist. Amen. That is Israel. <laughs> he can get along without America, but he will not get along without Israel. And these people are the, they are the ancient people. They've been around forever. As I said to you before, the book of Job is probably, I can't prove this, but it's probably the oldest book in existence. Amen. That's old, folks. 
What does that tell you about their culture? What does it tell you about the people? If they've got a book that was written almost 2,000 years before Christ, it's 4,000 years old almost. What does that tell you about these people? It tells you they've been around a long time. It tells you that they had an alphabet over 2,000 years before Christ. It tells you that they could write, they could read, that they handed their, that they passed their history from generation to generation. These people have been around a long time. And so the alignment of the nations here in the end time, the alignment of the nations is very important, very important. I want to show you this right here. In fact, I plan to do this, but I want you to see this. I showed this to our Sunday school class this morning. This is the Tower of Babel, or Babel, the Tower of Babel. But this is not the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis. This Tower of Babel is on a modern, contemporary graphic that, re that has a direct relationship to the European Union. They have made it plain to everyone that they're going about to establish a new Babylon. Do you think they're friends of Israel? No, no. What kingdom does this crowd belong to? You see, they're aligning themselves, folks. All the nations of the earth right now are aligning themselves either for Israel or against Israel. Every nation on planet earth must have a policy, a position as it relates to Israel. I don't know that every nation has a position as it relates to Portugal. <laughs> But as it relates to Israel, yes. Why? Because Israel is a hot potato. Yep. Amen. It's a hot potato. Israel, it is a hot potato. It affects all countries. Yes, that tiny little speck over there on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea, yep. you know, I think somebody said the state of New Jersey. I've, I can't remember exactly. I believe in land mass area. I believe it's about the same size as New Jersey or something like that. It's not very big at all. Texas would swallow it up a half a dozen times. And Israel is such a, such a remarkable place that these occultists, hold on, the European Union is a bunch of occultists who worship the queen of heaven, Jeremiah chapter number 44. They go down into a crypt and come back up out of that crypt with a black Madonna and they move around with her and they cry out for this cosmic Christ spirit to come down and anoint them. And David Spangler, who's over the United Nations Religious Initiative, is uh, leading the pact to call for the United, to call for the cosmic spirit of the Christ to come down. They want a Christ. They want an anointed one. They reject the Lord Jesus Christ of the New Testament, who's the only anointed one of God. Amen. He is the anointed one. Amen. But they've rejected him because they've rejected the Bible. So the Gentile nations, that's what this is, the Gentile nations are making their choices right now. Who will they align themselves with? Now, when Barack Obama went over there and stood with uh, David Cameron, the prime minister of Great Britain the other day, and he excoriated Britain because they were trying to pull out of the EU, he was preaching and lecturing them about how that they needed to stay in the EU, and if they wanted to trade with America, they would trade with America through the EU. He made it clear when David Cameron mentioned about Great Britain trading with America, he said, well, we could put you in the back of the line, <laughs> you know, because if you want to trade with us, in plainer words, we are pushing a one world global economic system, get on board. If you want to trade with the United States of America, then you jump, you, you stick with the EU. I'm glad Margaret Thatcher loved Great Britain more than she did them. Margaret Thatcher was entirely against all this junk. But here's the bottom line, folks. They're pushing, 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 pushing for this united, united economic system, united one world system, and it's coming to pass. And nations must make their choice. This is why it is so very, very important as to what the United States does in the next few weeks, months, and years as it relates to this. Which way will it go? Will the United States support Israel or will the United States turn against Israel? They've got to make a choice. And that's what's coming up. So we have the saints that are in the millennium. They're millennial saints. Some of them are born tribulation. They're, they're children of tribulation saints. They're born to them, going to the millennium. 
and others are whole nations that go into the millennium. These are the family of God in the millennium. Amen. So you've noticed that I've read off a, a, a quite a list of people that make up the family of God. I'll go back through quickly and read these for you. The saved Gentiles before the law, the saved Hebrews before the law, the Jewish believers under the law, the Gentile believers during the law, the church age believers, Jewish believers in the tribulation, Gentile believers in the tribulation, and the millennial saints. That's a good sized family. Yes, sir. I'm glad tonight I'm part of it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'll guarantee you one thing, buddy, when it comes to the body of Christ, the Lord will take anything. <laughs> Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? <laughs> He'll take anything. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. Before I came to church tonight, uh, some of you, how many of you know who Carla Faye Tucker was? Few of you remember. She was executed in the state of Texas in 1998. George W. Bush was the governor of Texas. Say, so who is Carla Faye Tucker, preacher? The other day I was out in my yard doing a little digging and I used a thing that had a, it had a broad blade on one side and the other side had a pick. How many know what I'm talking about? It's got a broad blade on one side, the other side a pick, you can swing it. Uh, some call it a pickaxe. She took a pickaxe and buried it in the head of someone, took that pickaxe and buried it in the body of somebody else. And I don't know how many people died during this crime spree. Hopped up on dope, wild out of her mind. She was a murderer. No question about it. That's indisputable. She was a murderer. So they put her in, in prison in the state of Texas. And while she was in there, somebody got to her and witnessed to Carla Faye Tucker and she got saved. And I remember her face. I remember the joy in her face. But it helps you to remember where she came from. It's shocking, even this, this far back, this far away from it, it's still shocking to read what she did. I mean, this is, this is brutal murder. But she got saved. And, and her salvation is indisputable. Real salvation. Carla Faye Tucker. Now, even Pat Robertson came out on her side to try to get her sentence commuted to where she wouldn't pay the ultimate price and to try to get her, you know, commuted to life in prison. Uh, but the governor of, 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 of Texas at the time, George W. Bush, uh, would not do it. I uh, did a little reading there, and I wasn't, uh, wasn't planning to run upon this, but how many's ever heard of Henry Lucas? Some of you have. Henry Lucas, and there's, to this day the police don't know yet, but Henry Lucas was responsible for the death of scores of people. Scores of people. And some even put it in the hundreds. And there's no way to really know, but here's the bottom line. Henry Lucas had murdered many, many, many people. Well, his sentence was commuted. And Henry Lucas was sentenced to death, but then the governor of Texas commuted his sentence and, and let him live out his life. And he died few years back with heart failure. He was 64 years old. Do you know who the governor was that commuted his sentence? George W. Bush. A soul. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not up here tonight to judge him. I'm not up here to judge him. You know, that's not my place. And he's the governor, and I'm sure as a governor, he's got some hard choices and decisions to make. She was a brutal murderer. No question about it. But you see, Lucas never made a profession of faith. She did. And I wish you could see her face. Just type in Carla Faye Tucker. They've got her photograph all over the internet. You see that you don't put on, you, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't fabricate what she had. It was in her eyes. It's all over her. She knew the Lord. Hallelujah to God. Have you ever thought about the fact that one day you're going to be standing right next to an axe murderess? <laughs> Amen. Like I say, the Lord will take anything. <laughs> I thought, man, he reached real low when he got her, but he raised her real high when he got her. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The world will never understand that. 
They'll never understand that. But one day I can look at her and I can embrace her as my sister when I walk down the streets of gold. And I won't see her as a murderess. I'll see her as a saint of God that's been born again by the grace of God. And a message like that should resound to anyone. You should be able to take a message like that to a man or a woman in the lowest state in life. I don't care how bad off they are. You should be able to take a message like that and say, look, if there was hope for Carla Faye Tucker, there should be hope for you. Amen. 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 And he saved her. No doubt about it. She's born again. And she accepted it. And when they said, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to commute. We're going to, you're, going to, you're going to pay for your, your crime. She accepted it. She, she accepted it, and she left this world. She was, uh, she was uh, executed by lethal injection, according to what it says on the, on the Internet. And she left here, and she closed her eyes here, and she opened them in glory. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Amen. And there's an awful lot of people, folks. Now, here's the fact. This is the truth. There's an awful lot of people that never murdered anybody, and they're good moral people. There's an awful lot of people that are upstanding in their communities, some of the greatest pillars in their church, and they're going to hell. She's in heaven, and they'll go to hell. And nothing enrages people any more than to say that to them because of their self-righteousness. And that's what's wrong. Amen. And I thank God for the fact that he can reach behind the prison bars. And he can reach into a prison cell. And he can save somebody like Carla Faye Tucker. Hallelujah. And he saved an old wretched dog like me. <laughs> and he can save you. And he can save anybody. And when he does save you, you're not the same anymore. I'm a member of the family of God. You know, when, uh, <clears throat> when that Satanist out there in California, Anton LaVey, died, <laughs> he was very loud about his hatred for God and his hatred for Christianity his hatred for Christ and all of that. And he wrote the Satanic Bible. And uh, when it came time for him to cross the bar like it comes to all of us, do you know what he said? He had a look come over his face. He was looking into eternity. He had a look come over his face. He said, uh-oh, I fear I have been wrong. And he died. I have been wrong, he said, and he died, and he went to hell, lost without God. Don't wait until you leave the world. Don't wait until it comes time to die to find out you've been wrong. You can do something about it right now. You can say, Lord Jesus, did you really save Carla Faye Tucker? Ask him. Did you really save her? You ought to read the story. You ought to read what she said. They've got all the stuff in there about how she talked to the people with her and how what they were going to do. And I mean, you talk about somebody whose mind was blown with dope. And I mean, it was as bad as it gets. Ask God what he did with Carla Faye Tucker. And ask him what he can do for you. Amen. He can save you and he can write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. I love that song, when the redeemed are gathering in. When the redeemed, Amen. redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The angels can never sing that song. That's right, that's right. Cherubim and cherubim can never sing that song. Amen. Amen. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. You'll never forget it. It'll never grow old. You'll never mix it up with anything else. Once you've ever been born again by the grace of God, your life's going to change and it'll change forever. Amen. You may not always be shouting. You may not always be on the mountaintop. You may, you may even be buckling under the load at times. But once that experience is real, it remains real and it cannot change. You're engraven in the palm of his hand. Written with blood in that blood book. It's called the book of life. That name's in there that cannot be erased. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. I firmly believe, folks, that you are the church of the firstborn. What that means is that you are the first ones born of the Holy Spirit of God. All must eventually be born of the Holy Spirit of God. 
There's no way that they can spend eternity in, with God without being born again. They've got to be born of the Holy Ghost. That's what born again means. It means born of the Spirit of the living God. And we are. The Bible says we are the church of the firstborn. The firstborn means we get a double blessing, a double potion. That means we're prophets. That means that we have the name of God attached to us. That means that we are the inheritance. The firstborn gets all of this. It's all ours because we are the firstborn. Amen. And all of them that follow, I don't know how far to go with it, but I do believe this. I do believe we'll be instructors and teachers. Yeah. I believe this body of Christ in the future will be the ones who point the way. We'll be the ones who show the way Amen. because we're part of the way. Because we're sons of God now by the new birth. And that can't be taken away from us. Church of the firstborn. Hallelujah to God. Born again. Have you been born again? All of the family of God are saved. They got to be saved or they're not the family of God. But they're not all born again. And that's a big mistake that a lot of Christians make. They just put everybody in the same bowl. And, you know, try to make the scripture apply to everybody the same way. And it doesn't do it because the Old Testament saints were not born again because there was no new covenant, not until the death of the testator. But now you can be, this is why Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. Except you're born again, you cannot, you can't even see the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. So I'm part of the family of God. John 8, 44, I was of my father, the devil, for 27 years. But then God saved me. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. Talking to a man the other day and uh, was asking about my salvation. And I know some reverends and some brethren and some of the Christians who would be offended for somebody to ask them about their salvation. Didn't offend me. <laughs> I relish the opportunity of telling you when I got saved, how I got saved, where I got saved. I remember when Bill Wright came up here. How many remember Bill Wright? And Bill came up and taught in our Bible Institute. That's where I learned Hebrew and Greek from Bill Wright. He came up here and spent uh, four or five years with us. His father-in-law came with him. And we met back here in this office, right back here, before, before it was all moved, my office over here. They all came back, and we were sitting around in there. His father-in-law looked over at me, and he said, uh, tell me when you got saved. <laughs> now, a lot of pastors would say, hold on, Hoss, I'm pastoring this church. I mean, man, <laughs> what do you mean, when did I get saved? Well, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't religious. <laughs> I looked at him and I told him when I got saved, just exactly when and how. And he was satisfied. That was it. Because he was going to leave his daughter and his son-in-law here in the ministry here at Temple Baptist Church. He went back to Pensacola, Florida. He left his daughter and his son-in-law here with us. And, uh, and he wanted to know where he was leaving them because he didn't know me from Job's turkey. <laughs> and I told him, would it offend you if somebody asked you to tell them about your salvation? <laughs> would you know what to say? I told you about this little girl I used, I used to, I, 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 uh, it's before I met my wife now, before I met her. <laughs> before. <laughs> but I did see this little girl back there a long time back. And, and I wound up over here in a, in a, in a, uh, a uh, what do you call it there in the, in, in the Christmas time? Salvation Army. They had a Salvation Army church over here next to the interstate. How many of you remember me telling you this before? Well, you don't remember it. Good. That's hallelujah. <laughs> so I'd go to church with her. And this was a weird thing. I learned real fast the first time I went to church there. They started with one end and went all the way to the other end. Everybody stood up and gave their testimony. I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> going to come to me. And I sat there and figured out what I was going to say. I made me up a good testimony. 
I thought, that sounds good. I put that on it. And this one over here, I like that too. I pulled this one up. I got that one over there. I compiled me a nice little time. I'm glad that I wasn't the first one. <laughs> I had enough time to hear everybody else's where I could create my own nice little testimony. That's good too. You should have heard it. <laughs> I mean, I had a testimony and a half. <laughs> And I didn't a bit more know the Lord than a goose in a hailstorm. <laughs> but you do, th you do strange things when you have to. You know what I mean? You really do. I think a lot of people in the church, their testimony is, <laughs> that sounded good. <laughs> yeah, I like that too. <laughs> I like it. That's got a little ting to it. Yeah, I just like to put all that together and memorize it and you're set for life. No, oh, I was a dirty, rotten, stinking, low-down dog going to hell, and then something come, came over my soul that had never come over me before, and I was lost without God, and I knew if I died, I'd be in hell, and I knew it, and I couldn't wait for somebody to open the Bible. I knew somebody had to pray with me and open the Bible, and when they prayed with me and I bowed my head on that sofa and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and I raised my head up, my life had changed. It was all new. I wasn't the same. And there's no way to explain that except a new birth. Hallelujah to God. Amen. All right, I'm done tonight. Reckon I'm in the doghouse, brother? <laughs> That's uh, Brother Sil. That's the first time she's heard this story. No, she's heard it before. Yeah. I think. <laughs> All right, Brother Silvius, would you come up here tonight and uh, lead us in a song? <laughs> Yes, sir, that was a long time before I met my wife. <laughs> it's all, see what? Let's all stand up here tonight. <laughs> I'm done. I won't say any more. I'll shut up. I'll get myself in trouble. I appreciate it. The <laughs> more I talk, the deeper I get. <laughs> Page 137, and you're all Amen. Have you been born again, folks? Have you been saved? Have you been born again? Family of God.